Today on The Topping Show, Bud Light loses a 4th of July popularity contest. Bud Light also launches another campaign and it fails epically. Ukraine announced that they will not hold elections. T Senator Chuck Schumer wants to investigate a prime energy drink. Stamps to increase their prices again. Porsche to develop their first EV car by 2025. National Geographic begins their final round of layoffs. Chevy Camaro is selling like hotcakes in the news that the new one will be an EV. Dollar Tree to finally bring back dollar prices. And Evernote app is starting to begin their layoffs once again. All that and much, much more on The Topic Show. Thank you everyone for taking the time to tune in today. Today's episode of The Topic Show is sponsored by Topping Technologies. Topping Technologies is an IT value added resource and services company with a special proficiency in IT security. Heck, I see their founder at least twice a day. Guys, is quite handsome and brilliant. He's me, that, that's a joke. If you're an IT leader or a business owner and need a little assistance, you can reach the team at sales at toppingtechnologies.com. Now, going on to the business part of the podcast, you have National Geographic beginning their final round of layoffs. Now, the publication has been around for a little bit over 100 years, and it's kind of just everyone knows them as Yellow Magazine because it has that distinct border that goes around the whole thing. Even when they debuted their channel on the cable network, they actually had their logo just basically a vertical rectangle with the yellow outline. So A minus A A to A minus for branding. It's very recognizable. And unfortunately, there just doesn't seem to be enough profit around these days. Now, it looks like they're laying off the last of the writers. That include 19 staff members. And the publication will no longer be sold at newsstands. Granted, I don't know how many newsstands are left in the United States and like physical stands you see in like 80s and 90s movies. But apparently there are still a couple out there and they apparently even they sell a couple things to this day, interestingly enough. Now, the company did say that they will still have future work, but the future editorial work will be instead done by freelance writers. And they'll have a couple editors remaining on the staff, this is according to the Post. And it's not too surprising. It's all part of cost cutting. Their parent company, which seemed to, uh, seems to own darn near every media company or every piece of media these days, is Disney. And famously, when Bob Iger came back as CEO, he wanted to let people know their goal is to cut a little bit over a billion dollars in production costs. And that was across company portfolios. And got to keep in mind, they also own everything from Lucasfilms, Marvel, pretty much anything that makes people happy. Although many of the movies these days are quite disappointments. But... They still own the intellectual property for many of these things. And it is kind of a sad little business transition when National Geographic used to be the pinnacle of, I want to say worldwide investigative reporting, going to lands that no one could ever possibly see. And at a time, it was quite revolutionary and a very important part, some might say, of the culture part of the podcast. But it's one of those things where, for many people, that was the only way they got to see those interesting perspectives, those interesting cultures across the globe. Very similar to the importance that money used to have back in the day in terms of physical artwork on U.S. currency. There used to be an emphasis on putting beautiful artwork on there and pieces of history because it was an education tool because many people didn't live close to a museum. A very similar concept where this is a very unique package and some of the articles are quite entertaining. But very similar to why money is so disgustingly designed these days. It, I, I almost threw up. I, I, I'm surprised people get paid to design U.S. currency in 2023 based on how woefully uninspiring they they are compared to vintage paper money, if you looked up, it's quite fascinating. But it's one of those things where, unfortunately, just kind of a victim of the times, some might say. This would be a perfect pun if Times Magazine was also laying off people, but that's not this week. That'll probably be next week. It's one of those issues where, thanks to the internet, everyone is so interconnected and everyone is on social media a lot of the things that you could only find on a National Geographic catalog or magazine, well, now you can see that within one click on your phone, with the proliferation of smartphones especially, in addition to having I mean, just the World Wide Web, a big reason that people used to have for National Geographic is no longer there. And unfortunately, they really didn't pivot or adapt with the fast pace of entertainment news and entertainment in general and publications. Unfortunately, it didn't look like they made the right moves to adapt and they're going to be scaling back dramatically. And hopefully all those old writers, photographers, hopefully they'll be able to find gainful employment in a, maybe a different news outlet or they'll find a different niche of things to report on. And hopefully they won't be 
too many jobs lost overall. Now, other interesting businesses, you have Porsche saying they're going to develop their first EV sports car, which I didn't throw up in my mouth, but it certainly tastes acidic. Now, this is going to be specifically for the 2025 Porsche 918 Cayman slash Boxster, as some might call it. Now, their Cayman is a more economical sports car, and the engine is slightly more to the middle. There's a lot of nuances. The Porsche many people aspire to get is the 911. That's been the staple of the sports car community for decades, quite literally. And it is interesting to see them make this pivotal move. This is also going to be a, the first Porsche on the, and I'm looking at a quote here, quote, the Volkswagen Group's PPE platform. That means that almost nothing will carry over from the current Porsche Cayman 918. The chassis balance will remain the same because the battery will occupy most of the space next to the firewall where the engine is today. It's almost like they're removing the heart from the vehicle. I almost feel that right now in real time. That's not part of the quote. Get back to the quote. It's going to be where the engine is today to ensure the car's current mid-engine handling will remain intact. A 900 volt electrical architecture will ensure the fastest DC charging, unquote. That's one of those things where there's a time and place for everything. EVs certainly have their application, especially if you're transporting very light materials. There's a lot of people speculating around EV semi-trucks based on the application that may or may not make sense. But people don't buy a Porsche because it's the fastest car on the planet or it has a thousand horsepower. That, that's never really been the attention of the brand. It's all, they, they understood and they've learned this lesson because of the customer feedback and the overwhelming demand for having that third pedal also known as a stick shift, also known as the pinnacle of automotive experience. If you have any experience that, that I implore you to go find out, go experience that as soon as possible. And if you have, again, I'm not a financial analyst or a financial expert, but if you have a plethora of cash in your bank account, you want to have some fun, get a new car with the stick shift because there's less and less of them every single day, unfortunately. Now, it looks like not only are they changing the drivetrain, but the cost is going to go up, of course. So. It looks like th th this is current estimates, of course, this is years out, suppliers and components can change, overhead can change, but it looks like they're estimating that this EV version will cost $15,000 more than the current base Porsche 718. So not only are you paying an astronomical, to me, 15 grand is a lot of money, especially if you're paying that much of a Delta to get an EV, which again, with the current technology we have, will not last long. This is a, a business blunder of the day, perhaps, for Porsche. Make a new car. Call it something else. Diversify into a new product line if you must. But it's one of those things where if you look at the Facebook forums and the automotive community, one of the nice things about Porsche, with the, with the one glaring issue being the IMF bearing from one of the old Porsche 911s, they're usually pretty reliable, thanks because it has an internal combustion engine. If you look on Facebook, a 2001 or 2003 Porsche 911 still goes for sometimes six figures. They hold their value partially because they're robust, the technology is proven, and it's a fun experience. So it is sad to see the Germans acquiescing to more and more EV technology and more accurately, or my point, taking one of your most popular vehicles and turning it into an EV. It's one of those things where get creative, start a new car that's EV from the ground up. It, give the customers what they want. And unfortunately, with the automotive industry, I know there's a lot of regulations globally in the United States, and they're new, doing this primarily because of government interference and in regulations. And hopefully that changes. But as the Magic 8 Ball might usually says, outlook, not so good. Other interesting automotive news, which kind of proves my other point, you have the Chevy Camaro the gas version skyrocketing in popularity, 110%. Now, this is Chevrolet's last V8 vehicle with a stick shift, which in and of itself makes it worth something. It breaks my heart that Mary Barra, the CEO of General Motors and the team over there thought, we're gonna make the new Corvette rear engine, controversial enough, I understand there's a lot of benefits to it, but automatic only, as they pretend to compete with Lamborghini and Ferrari. They never will. It's a separate category. It used to be, for my whole lifetime, the, the Corvette was American performance and economical price point. The idea was, you know, for a fraction of the price, you could beat Ferrari or Lamborghini on the track. 
You're not going to beat them on aesthetics. Interior quality, no. But bang for your buck for the horsepower, great vehicle with a stick shift. To me, I almost feel like the Corvette, maybe they peaked at 2003, Corvette Z06, which only came in a stick shift. There's a lot of arguments for the C7 versions, but I respect those as well. And this kind of proves the point that customers want a V8 with a stick shift. They want a muscle car. And because GM and their brilliance has decided, we're going to bastardize the Camaro name by turning it into an EV four-door sedan, which again, you will not win. Tesla has... Tesla has gotten a solid chunk of that market already. And to try to pretend that you can compete them with the current technology you have, with the current engineering infrastructure you have, it's not gonna happen. You might have some nice body panels you could slam on there, I guess. Again, be innovative, take a risk on something new, not, not just trying to copy the competition. But I digress, back to the point, it looks like the demand rose quite literally 110.3% during fiscal Q2 this year compared to the same time period last year. Now in 2002, there's just 4,545 deliveries of the Chevy Camaro between April and June. This year, they delivered, also known as sold, 9,557 Chevy Camaros. The CEO, Mary, Mary Barra, should, Barra, should read that headline and be like, wow, people want this vehicle? Let's keep making it. We, we can make another sedan that's EV Call it something else. Get get the marketing department to wake up or do something with their lives. Think of a new name. But people love this current Camaro. And even not only just a quarter, year over year, they're doing great too. Year over year, their sales are up 54% compared to 2022% or 2022. So as of this time last year, it looks like Chevy sold 11,255 of their vehicles or of uh, Camaros. And that figure increased by more than 6,000 units to 17,337 units in 2023. People want these vehicles. It's a great staple of the pony community. And that's probably why everyone is buying it. It's because it's the last, the last muscle car, at least GM. You have the Cadillac CTSV, which, thank God, still comes with a stick shift. But it's the last... Chevy, well, I know it's not made Chevy's to begin with, but to be able to get a stick shift to the V8, the, the time is, unfortunately, the, the time, the clock is ticking. There's not much time left as the government regulations increase, the tailpipe emissions increase, which de facto kills the V8. And of course, unfortunately, more Americans are not educated in the three pedals of joy, which they should be. If I was in charge of education, I'd be like, Mandatory for all driver's ed classes. Learn how much fun it is to drive with a stick shift and three pedals. And people will know how much fun it can be from the ground up. And I really hope GM sees these sales figures and realizes we can make a lot more money if we just continue making this product. Maybe make, make another EV that will offset your whole, they call it the fleet emissions average. So there are emission standards for how all your vehicles and you can only put out so much smog and so much stuff. Make a new EV, call it something else, and have that be your four-door EV sedan that people might buy. That's a big might. There's a lot of competition now. And again, Tesla's been leading for probably a decade now, for almost quite some time. And we'll see. Hopefully, they keep alive. But as of right now, it seems like the only American muscle car left is the Ford Mustang, which some might argue it's never lost the Pony War or it won the Pony War because unlike the Chevy Camaro and unlike the Challenger Charger, Ford never stopped production of the vehicle. Yes, they did bastardize it with some bad engines over the years as the EPA likes to poke them every once in a while, but they never stopped making it. So as of right now, it looks like the riding off in the sun, or what is a horse? Horses, are, horses don't ride off. Prancing off into the, sun, the sunset Looks like Ford Mustang wins the Pony Wars. But time shall tell. Now, other interesting business news, you have the Dollar Tree bringing back dollar items, thankfully. Now, famously, I believe it was last, about 12, 18 months ago, the store called the Dollar, dollar Tree, which some might say was deceptive in and of itself since the state steals, I mean, charges about, you know, sales taxes. So in Texas, it's 8.25%. So it's really not a dollar, it's, you know, maybe dollar, dollar nine or dollar 10 if you round up. But 
thanks to the COVID crisis with the supply chain disruptions, a lot of things in the dollar store made in China, and just overall hyperinflation by printing more money than God's ever seen. Is, there's a lot of contributing factors why they did have to raise their prices from a dollar to a dollar twenty-five, which doesn't sound like to a lot of people, but you gotta remember, there's the people who use the Dollar Tree and the dollar stores as their grocery stores. Imagine having 25% of your budget is eviscerated because they raised the prices. That's an astronomical delta, and it hurts a lot of people. So a lot of people were upset, and unfortunately, instead of having a competitive landscape or having a competitive value where the other stores didn't raise their prices, many of them did, so that there wasn't an extra incentive to switch stores. Now, it looks like this isn't going to be for all items. It looks like it's going to be, according to the chief merchandising officer, Ricky McNeely, he estimates that about 200, or sorry, 300 to 400 items will be actually rolled back to a dollar. And he also noted that in terms of their total number of SKUs, they actually have 8,000 SKUs for Dollar Tree. Also known as 8,000 different products that they sell, which, geez Louise, that, I never realized, every once in a while I'll go there, and I never realized 8,000 different items. It's astronomical. So it is going to help a lot of people out getting back that dollar price, but in terms of percentage, that's only about 5% of their total inventory. So it's going to help, and hopefully it targets the items that people need the most, and obviously they have to make sure they don't lose money on certain items, so it has to be more profitable ones to begin with, so they can absorb that extra delta. And, you know, time shall, time, time shall tell. Now, going on to the culture part of the podcast, you have Bud Light putting out yet another Twitter advertisement and failing epically. Now... This one hilariously had a woman, uh, of course she was white, eating, um, sitting down eating watermelon at a picnic. And it was a really weird thing in which the whole tornado came and everything was jumping off the table. All the little table linens, the plates, the Bud Lights apparently. They were that light. They actually flew away, probably moderately intended. But everything was just chaos all around her. And they actually had the caption. They called this advertisement, this is fine. Which is hilarious because one of the most popular memes you see on the internet is that little dog sitting in a room where the whole room is on fire. And that's what the meme is. This is fine. So, of course, the responses to that were more entertaining than the actual post in itself. And it's quickly ratioed within minutes. A fascinating social media phenomenon in which more people actually responded positively, more positively to the responses than the original post. So, of course, everyone was poking fun at them. They have not forgot their business blunder of the century. And it is hilarious to see all the memes continue to creep, creep up. and cr They just haven't learned. And again, time shall tell if they ever actually address the issue. I suspect they shan't. Because, again, that would cause an exponential increase in the boycott, politically speak of, for, speaking, from people on the left. Which, of course... They were quite vocal in their opinions. And for the first time in darn near probably 10, 20, 30 years or ever, the people on the right are actually speaking up and sounding off. So they're being heard as well. So the CEO of Bud Light, Brendan Whitworth, former CIA operative, literally, he actually said they're going to spend about three times as much on advertising this summer as they did last. Again, I'm not, well, I was about to say I'm not as smart as, as him, but I don't, know how, I don't know how low that bar is. We, we, everyone watching this video may very well have better judgment than he has in terms of business acumen. But if I, again, if I was the CEO of Anheuser-Busch, don't, I wouldn't spend a single penny on Bud Light advertising. Focus on every other brand that people don't realize is your brand. Because those might increase. Big might. Because the competition is just eating up all the delta and how much sales they're losing for Bud Light. The competition is actually gaining those sales at the same rate and actually a little bit more in some areas. So it'll be interesting to see, does Bud Light continue to just pump out more advertising on the Twitter than they can count? Similar to the Call of Duty boycott where they just thought instead of addressing the issue, just pump out a massive volume of advertisements and hope people will give up or stop resisting. Time shall tell, but we'll see. Bud Light's in a tailspin. It's going to take some pretty good navigating to actually pull them out of it. We'll see. Other interesting cultural news, you have Bud Light losing yet again, this time at a July 4th infographic. Now, this is a map that consisted of where the most popular beers on a state-by-state -state basis, 
And those were done on the base of the geotagging on Twitter as well as the hashtags. So everyone who goes on the Twitter sphere and tweets how they love certain brands, XYZ. And spoiler alert, Bud Light and Budweiser didn't win a single state out of all 50. Think about that. Zero? They used to be the number one best-selling beer. For 20 years, Bud Light had that pinnacle of sales. And thanks to Alyssa Heyerschel, the former VP of Marketing, and the whole team over there, they just they have just gone downhill exponentially. And it's fascinating because once you think that once people think they're bottling them out, they continue to just keep going down. It's it's almost impressive from a certain perspective. I can't help but think if or wonder if the CEO shorted the stock as a phenomenon in which you actually bet against your stock. So if it goes down, you make money. That's got to be a conspiracy theory if it's not already out there. I, I admit maybe I am probably out there, but I digress. Now, when it comes to the map, it looks like the number one beer by the number of states in which they won that contest was Modelo Especial, winning 12 states. And again, in the United States, they're a separate brand from Anheuser Busch InBev. The only reason that, or the main reason the Securities Exchange, Exchange Commission in the United States, also known as the SEC, allowed the two companies to merge was that they said, okay, in the United States, you have to spin off this brand. So in the United States, all sales of Modelo Special actually contributed to a company known as Constellation Brands. So they own that brand here. Globally, yes, if you buy Modelo in, Mex in um, maybe Spain or what other countries are there? Germany, Italy, if you buy it over there, then yes, you are supporting Andrew Bush and Beth. The United States, if you're boycotting the brand, that still counts as a win. So again, the number one was Modelo Special coming in at 12 states. You had Coors Light coming in at 11 states. Miller Light coming in at 11 states. Yaling coming in at eight states. And in last place, you have Michael Ultra winning eight states. Now, it is important to note, in the United States, as well as globally, Modelo, yeah, it is separate, but you do have Michelob Ultra that is owned by Bud Light Budweiser, Anheuser-Busch, and Bev is part of their 52, or I believe not 51, brands in their portfolio. And I don't know if a lot of people realize that. I suspect as the boycott continues, you're going to have more and more people start to realize, oh gosh, wait a minute, that's, that's the same company? Or maybe it's the demographic of people who already purchased that product, they're not as affected by the boycott or they just don't care. It'd be interesting to see if there's a more of a deeper analysis of why that particular brand seems to not be going down at the same rate as Bud Light, especially, and then you have Budweiser. Those are the two biggest brands currently being negatively affected by the boycott. It'll be interesting to see, as they continue to lose the cultural war, what's gonna happen to the brands? Are they gonna have to reinvest that money into the other brands in the portfolio, or do they just keep putting out a massive volume of advertisements for Bud Light and Budweiser, hoping people forget, or just overwhelming them by volume of material similar to their sales methodology don't make the best beer just make a massive volume of beer which worked for 20 years until they decided to mess up perhaps they will invest in better marketing talent this year time shall tell now other interesting cultural news you have ukraine announcing they will not hold elections which is interesting because i was told it was paramount to support ukraine because they stand for democracy and Freedom. I, I was told that. It was in the news. They don't lie there. Now, currently Zelensky will of course remain in power, the former comedian, now president of the Ukraine, or dictator, depending on who you ask. And he claims, he promises they will have elections after the war. Which, yeah, is exactly what every tyrant in history has said. That's what they told my family, that's why they got the hell out of Cuba. They go, like, oh, yeah, we, we promise we're going to seize the power, and w once things settle down, we'll allow, we'll allow voting and freedom. No. And, as a wise man once said, character is never truly known until it's tested. People can talk about hypotheticals all they want, but when the real world or when the rubber hits the ground, so to say, sometimes the results are quite different. In this case, he has the power, he's not going to give it up, and can't have, can't just, he's not going to allow elections. No. Even though every cultured and civilized society does hold elections, the United States has always held elections throughout the entire history of our country. The, the best country in history, bar none. 
I'm remiss the United States flag is not behind me. It's in the podcast room or the interview podcast room. But Black, Blockbuster was American, too. Headquartered in the best state in the Union, Texas. So, kind of the transitive property. But I can't fathom this going well. Granted, the whole world is behind Ukraine. They're not going to lose any funding over this or any additional assistance or aid. But this is also one of those things where I think people should be concerned because, again, every culture, even the, no matter what, we always hold elections. Granted, we're, all, we're also the best. It's hard to compare to the best. But it's interesting from a cultural perspective, I'm not seeing too much pushback on this news. You've seen a couple of Twitter articles, a couple of people tweeting about it. But you're not seeing anyone from you know CNN, Fox News, MSNBC criticizing this heavily. They're just kind of going with the flow. And from a cultural perspective, it'll be interesting to see, does this affect the United States public support for Ukraine? Which Congress has given them over $100 billion and counting. It'll be interesting to see, do more people oppose the war now? Are they going to write to their congressman and be like, um, or maybe they'll call him because they're old-fashioned and be like, Hey, uh, well, we, we sent them $100 billion. What have you done for Rice Ball Town? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're fighting for democracy. Oh, yeah, yes, yes. Uh, you mean the country where they can't vote for uh, their leader? Yes. Oh, that one? Oh, oh okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. Interesting. Now, I, I apologize for those who missed that pun. Now, back in the day, you used to have phones in which you would speak into them, and there'd actually be a physical, you know, about maybe about that big, and you have a part, you know, a little circular thing you talk in, you hear in. And you actually put it up to you. It wasn't just a panel like a cell phone. It was fascinating times from technology. As the, um, the guys in the Star Trek universe might say, um, a different uh, a weapon for a more sophisticated age. Obviously, I'm joking. I know that's South Park. Star Wars, calm down. Now, going into the, to the political part of the podcast, you have Senator Chuck Schumer asking the FDA to examine Prime. Yet another reason to be involved and aware of politics if you own a business or if you're a consumer. Now, Prime is an energy drink that is most well connected with the influencer known as Logan Paul. He advertises the absolute crap out of it, and apparently it's a collaboration in which you have a manufacturing company and him coming together with joint joint ownership. And he always has it on every show, every, every interview, the brand is prominently displayed. And... In terms of criticism and why Chuck Schumer wants the FDA to examine it, he says he's concerned about the caffeine levels, which is ridiculous. You can never have too much caffeine. Caffeine is the best thing in the planet. You never have too much caffeine. You just really have you know, two or three pots of coffee. Never have any side effects. Caffeine's the best. You don't need to rest. Someday I was a poet, but I didn't even know it. Now, specifically Chuck Schumer that notes that the little things of Prime, the 12-ounce Prime can, or I think it's plastic, whatever the beverage container is, it contains 200 milligrams of caffeine, which is equivalent to six cans of Coke or two Red Bulls, which he's probably got to be talking about the small ones. They have like 12 different sizes these days. So not the best analogy because there's a lot of variables with the Red Bull sizing, but people understand the idea. They have a lot of caffeine in them. Now, his perspective and why he thinks it's an issue is because of the potential demographic of who's watching Logan Paul. Now, the people watching Logan Paul usually have a decreased brain cell count between 12 and 29. Joking, moderately. But a lot of them are youth. They're kids, which caffeine, obviously, for children. You have to be especially careful. And right now, the Prime drink does have a giant warning, a little warning on it, similar to the CDs we used to buy, which uh, CDs and, and phones, I'm, I'm aging myself. CDs is known as a compact disc. It actually be a piece of plastic with some metal flakes on it. They compact it and they use a laser to write image, um, write data on it. You put it into a computer or a PlayStation 2 more accurately and you listen to music or play a video game or watch a movie. But if it was a music CD and it had some expletive language, you have a little warning on there that says, you know, expletive, expletive language. If your parent actually does their job, you should pay attention to this and not buy it for your child or more, or also, you know, review it. Now, that goes on to a whole different tangent of parents not doing their job, but Nevertheless, with certain products in the United States, you have these extra warnings. Now, if you look at some of the energy drinks, you have Monster, All the Rockstar. There is a description, a little disclaimer, it says, you know, not for pregnant or nursing women, which that's not very inclusive language these days. They're going to get sued, I'm sure. Now, they also say not for people sensitive to caffeine. So Chuck Schumer is saying, hey, it has a, 
he didn't say this, but they do have a warning already. I don't think he brought that point home, but he is concerned that they're targeting children. And he also argues that the product is very bright in terms of all the colors of so the bands around it. They're very neon, it's very attractive from an eye perspective. And he's saying that, well, kids are attractive to, uh, attracted to the colors. And because of Logan Paul's audience, that's probably the main demographic of who's seen this product for sale. And you do have some schools that started to carry the product and then the schools actually did their research. I know they usually, many don't. They realized the high caffeine levels and then they banned it from their schools. Of course, they still have enough corn syrup to kill a horse with the little sodas that they do sell to the schools and the little, little, all the food that they sell, but you, you can't have that energy. I moderately digress. It'll be interesting to see from a political perspective, is he trying to get this product pulled from the FDA, also in the, oh, known as the Food and Drug Administration, is he trying to get the product pulled? Does he want a bigger warning label? I'm not sure what his end goal is, but from a business perspective, they should be pretty scared because never, ever, ever, ever has increased regulation or increased scrutiny increased their sales. With the exception of like maybe one or two companies where they, with the exception of maybe firearms, because brilliantly when there's a rumor of an additional firearm law, the sales just exponentially increase. That might be one of the few instances where it's an inverse effect Granted, that also goes, it really doesn't count if the law passes because then you can't buy the product. But yeah, if I were Logan Paul, I'd be pretty uh, a little concerned and thinking, how might we change the product or change the marketing of the product so that it is not scrutinized as much? Because more scrutiny, they're going to decrease their sales. And we'll see. Other interesting political news is a paramount to your life. Stamps, they're increasing the price again. Moderately joking. I know I'm probably the only person under 50 who loves snail mail. I actually write cards to all my clients and prospective clients for talking technologies. And there's something nice about getting something in the mail that isn't a bill. It's pretty rare these days and a great way to stand out from the competition. It's a thoughtful, it's one of the things where it's thoughtful, it's unique. So it hits hard when I find out they're increasing their prices yet again. So now a single postage stamp is going to cost you 66 cents. 66 cents for a single postage stamp. Ridiculous. That's an increase by the previous price. The previous price was 63 cents. Skyrocketing. It's out of control. Now, this is the second time they've increased the price of stamps this year and three times in the past 12 months. Now, this is abhorrent and disgusting enough. It also doesn't help that competition is not allowed. I'm serious. If you try to write a card to your grandparents or your parents or someone, you can't go to the UPS store or the FedEx store. It has to be the United States Postal Service, which that and the DMV are probably per the, perhaps the most best, most accurate reason of why the private sector is best in every single way. And thankfully, you don't have to always go there. You just put in your mailbox. But if you have to go there, heaven forbid, oh, it's torture. I, I can't imagine... A worse experience than that. Now, they claim that they're increasing this price as part of their 10-year plan to overhaul its services as it charges more and tries to adapt to the increase in the sale distribution of packages as opposed to stamps. Which, if you look at business trends, that is true. Is exponentially more packages being sent this days? Thankfully, and partially, well, actually, I would say mainly in part to the just proliferation of e-commerce as everything is sold out, darn near everything is sold online these days, it makes sense because of that you're gonna have an exponential increase in the services needed for shipping parcels. And the USPS actually does subcontracting work for amazon.com. So it's not just people who, it's not just for the 10 people who still trust the USPS to mail their stuff directly, they actually have Amazon and other companies doing it as well. Unfortunately, if you, you know, try to get cookies mailed, they'll probably get to you in crumbs forms. I digress, but it'll be interesting to see what goes on. I'm not, again, I'm not a financial expert, but I can't help but think I'm doing pretty good these days. A couple years ago, I spent like, a, what was it? 30 bucks on a, on a couple of books of stamps, the forever stamps, which again, like the name says, is they're good for forever. So that one single stamp will still apply for I send one card these days. I might have to retire. They keep increasing their prices. Maybe sell them again. I don't know. The end, I mean, the options are endless. Who knows? I could be the stamp baron. 
something interesting, but obviously I'm joking. Stamps are decreasing in popularity. I can't help but also wonder if they're increasing the price just to kind of discourage people from sending cards as they see more profits and they see more money from packages. Hopefully we have to actually open up the category of snail mail to competitors so that I can go to a UPS and they could actually send a snail mail card for me. Well, we'll see. As I always say, time shall tell. Now, going on to the business blunder of the day, you have Evernote beginning more layoffs. So Evernote is an application that is, quote, a note-taking and task management application developed by Evernote Corporation. It was intended for archiving and creating notes in which photos, audio, and saved web content can be embedded. Notes are stored in virtual, quote, unquote, notebooks and are tagged, annotated, anno annotated? edited, searched, and exported. Interesting idea. It's good for the digital age, I'm sure. Thankfully, I have my spiral notebook, so you can't hack that. It's paper, which I just I might just spend three minutes talking about what a paper is for some people because it's seemingly used so little these days. But an interesting idea for people that are using more notes digitally, and it certainly seems like it makes business sense. Unfortunately, it looks like they're being their layoffs yet again. The current layoffs are going to affect U.S. workers as well as workers in Chile, and they plan to migrate most of those jobs over to Europe. Now, this is coming off of the news actually five months earlier where they laid off about 129 workers. And when asked for comment, the spokesperson actually admitted that they had been unprofitable for years. That's a quote, quote, unprofitable for years, unquote. And they were actually recently purchased by Italian app developer Bending Spoons when they acquired them past November, which... B plus for marketing, Bending Spoons does sound kind of cool. And it actually is reminiscent of Matrix, which is an extremely popular show, or rather movie. I think they have spin-offs as cartoons and shows, but pretty good marketing, made me think twice. But it is sad to see that well, a lot of these tech companies, they look for the, you're seeing the same with uh, Facebook and Twitter. There's a huge number of people who sign up for the service and the metrics when they start the company is all about the user rate adaptation, not necessarily the profit per user. So they end up losing a lot of money per user and the more users you get, the worse it gets. It's just the aggregate. It just gets worse and worse and worse. And unfortunately, it sounds like a lot of these jobs are going away. I mean, thankfully, app development is a huge industry in and of itself. So hopefully they overall, not too many jobs are lost overall. Maybe you get jobs at a different app development company. But... Not, to not make some more pivotal moves earlier, I mean, it looks like they've known about this for quite some time. Maybe they need to send, I know it sounds cliche, but maybe sell some advertising or focus more on business-to-business -business applications, selling this to companies that would have their employees use it. But unfortunately, it sounds like they're doing pretty bad and a lot of people are going to be out of jobs. So that's, I mean, Evernote, that's got to be the business blunder of the week. But time shall tell. The week is only about halfway through. For now, it's the business blunder of the day. Thank you everyone for taking the time to tune in today. We're trying to get to 3,000 subscribers, so every time you subscribe, it really helps the channel out. Also, don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment. The feedback is greatly appreciated. We've made the show better and better thanks to your input, whether it's me pontificating more, more hand gestures, or putting images on the screens in front of me so I can try to keep more eye contact. All the feedback really helps me make the channel better and better. Also, don't forget to tell your family, tell your coworkers, tell your friends, heck, tell your enemies, tell anyone and everyone. Just stay safe and fight the good fight.